Our presenters today will be Gavin Hill, Director of Threat Intelligence, and he is joined by Carl Bourne, Global Solution Architect at Venify. Before we get started, I wanted to walk through a couple of quick housekeeping items. First of all, acknowledge that we have left some time at the end of the webinar to answer your questions in real time. So please take time throughout the call to submit your questions via the Q&A window, and we'll circle back at the end. Please also acknowledge that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available to you online. Now I'm going to turn the time over to Gavin. Thanks, Judy. So today what we want to go through is, first and foremost, we want to look at what is the impact of DevOps to the business and talk through a couple of use cases related to where DevOps is having the most impact, as well as, on that same note, where DevOps is also introducing risk to the business. It's all about going fast with DevOps, but at the same time, there is risk that's been introduced within every organization by DevOps teams. And the big question then is, how can IT security keep up with DevOps, but at the same time, secure the business? Then what we're going to do is Carl Bourne is going to run through a couple of demonstrations on how Venify has helped DevOps teams as well as IT security teams keep up with the business demands, but at the same time looking at how do they ensure both uh, IT security and DevOps teams are in compliance with policies uh, set forth by the organization without slowing down the DevOps teams at all. So with that, I'm going to get it straight into it. And first and foremost, what I like to do is look at uh, where exactly within every organization are keys and certificates used. And if you think about it, for, we've listed out a couple of use cases here. Keys and certificates are really essential to your security strategy and really essential to everything that you do online today from an authorization perspective or uh, mobility or Internet of Things or even privileged access, uh, even out to the cloud, keys and certificates are used everywhere to provide that trust. But the challenge is when that trust is broken down or when DevOps teams, for example, can't necessarily acquire or collect or install those keys and certificates at the speed that they need, this is where vulnerabilities Start and risks start getting introduced within every single enterprise. DevOps absolutely fuels innovation, but as per this survey that we worked with Vanson and Bourne on, 79% of CIOs admit that DevOps teams make it a whole lot more difficult for them to understand what is trusted versus what's not trusted. And the reason for that is, we'll talk about this a little bit later on, is if you look at DevOps teams, they're all about going fast, getting the project done, and moving on to the next things. They're not necessarily PKI experts. The challenge, though, is when it comes to acquiring and provisioning keys and certificates throughout that build process, keys and certificates tend to slow the entire process down, which then results in DevOps teams going about and doing things on their own, which then also results in issues whereby, as you see here, 79% of CIOs don't necessarily know what's trusted versus what's, what's trusted anymore. So let's look at where DevOps relies on keys and certificates in a typical environment. And this by no means is an exhaustive list of use cases. It's just a quick snapshot of some of the most common use cases where we do see DevOps teams utilizing keys and certificates. First and foremost, in applications. So if you think about it from application to other network entities from an authentication perspective or even from a secure communication perspective, even signing parts or components or even commands. Um, think of PowerShell commands, for example. When it comes to containers and container security, it's all about how do you ensure secure communication between those containers. So TLS, for example, is, and in that case, that's where you need keys and certificates to establish those TLS sessions. Also, how do you go about automatically injecting those specific keys and certificates within those containers? This is a challenge for many DevOps teams. Another use case is mobile or enterprise mobility, where you have secure app-to-app -app communication or even, in fact, VPN communication within each app that requires keys and certificates per app to establish that VPN session. And then end-user authentication. 
IoT is another big area that's starting to take hold where keys and certificates are absolutely critical in the authentication to the network, for example, again, using TLS, and same thing from a secure communication perspective. So as you can see, if you look at the enterprise environment today, there's really no more perimeter where you now have cloud apps, you have container apps, you have uh, mobile apps, and anything you have it within the traditional data center. In all of these areas, DevOps teams need keys and certificates to go about ensuring that whatever service or application they're standing up is being delivered to end users and customers in a, in a secure manner. The question, though, to ask is, even though DevOps is moving at speed, DevOps can absolutely introduce vulnerabilities within the organization. And where are those vulnerabilities being introduced? If you can't answer any of these questions, for example, can you enforce policies within your DevOps build process? Do you know where all of those keys and certificates are throughout that build process? What encryption keys are you using in that build process? Do you have some, some type of centralized visibility or centralized control around that process? Um, are you able to remediate if there are any issues or any vulnerabilities that are identified? So for example, a vulnerability might be a duplicate key um, or where you need to swap out specific um, certificates because they've been configured with weak hashing algorithms. The other question is, are you compliant? So are you able to prove compliance as to where, how, and who is using the specific keys throughout your organization. If you can't answer any of these questions, and if DevOps teams are using keys and certificates, the DevOps teams are probably introducing risk within your organization, and you need to be able to address that. So security has to protect at speed. Why? Well, 40% of organizations are targeted every day by, by application attacks. And if security can't protect at speed, what's going to happen is it's going to result in some negative consequences where we see some issues, for example, like this being introduced within organizations by DevOps teams. That is, in some cases where it's not required, DevOps teams might not even use TLS or SSL to secure the connection. So it's completely open where a man in the middle attack is very easy uh, to collect the data and then exfiltrate the data. The other is create their own certificate authorities um, because they don't necessarily want to wait for IT security and it's taking too long. The other is create self-signed certificates. Or when they're creating those self-signed certificates or acquiring certificates from outside of the organization, maybe from an unauthorized certificate authority, they're potentially introducing risk of vulnerability by using, say, weak uh, signing algorithms. Um, so in this case, what, these are some of the common use cases that we do see within organizations where DevOps teams are introducing risk to the organization, and not through nefarious intent, but simply because they're not PKI experts and they're looking to get their job done, and keys and certificates are slowing down the overall process. So how can we help these organizations address that? Some of the negative consequence of those issues result in things like data breaches, as I touched on earlier, or failed audits, lack of compliance, or even application outage. Think of, for example, where throughout the build process, um, a certificate is required for an application to set up a TLS session. And the DevOps teams implement that certificate, but they're not responsible for day-to-day -day managing of that certificate. They're not PKI experts. That certificate then expires later on and results in an application failure, which results in a service outage. That's quite a common issue that we do see within organizations, specifically introduced from DevOps teams, and that's because DevOps teams are not responsible for managing or ensuring that keys and certificates, in this case certificates, don't expire. And then swapping out those respective expired certificates so that there are no application outages. So if we look at this problem and we try and 
identify what is the minimum criteria that's required to resolve this issue where DevOps teams are potentially introducing risk of vulnerabilities within the organization. First and foremost, in order to address this situation, we need to provide to DevOps teams an easy-to-use API so that they can acquire the keys and certificates in a quick, simple manner so that they're also able to do it from a secure perspective as well as automatically generate that key material. Now, it's important to provide that API and then also important to do it in an automated fashion simply because that's how DevOps teams are used to working as well as you're removing that pain point of manually acquiring keys and certificates and then manually installing those keys and certificates or even spending the time scripting out that process. At the end of the day, that's time wasted or time that the development teams or DevOps teams can go ahead and utilize that time to work on more strategic things versus trying to acquire and install keys and certificates. And then lastly, you also want to be able to make sure that you're able to enforce IT security policy throughout that build process so that you can be in compliance. Let's look at then how DevOps teams introduce vulnerabilities throughout that build process. This is a, a, a simplified overall build process of what most DevOps teams are accustomed to, where you go about application config, build, test, package, and then finally deploy. But where things tend to go wrong throughout this process when it comes to keys and certificates is in that package phase where DevOps teams need to either use self-signed certificates or they get a certificate from an unapproved CA simply because they don't want to wait for IT security or IT security teams are taking too long to get the certificate to them. Um, so acquisition time takes too long, usually days. The challenge then is in that deployment phase, you're not just deploying that unapproved certificate or introducing a vulnerability related to that certificate on one system. You're actually introducing that vulnerability or that unapproved certificate on hundreds, if not thousands, of systems where IT security has no security, there's no security, and there's no visibility for IT security either. So how do we go about ensuring that DevOps teams can secure the business at speed or IT security are able to keep up with DevOps teams. If you look at both that package and deployment phase, this is where one could use the Venify API call. Simple get certificate, um, one line piece of code to go ahead and acquire that certificate during that package phase, package it all up, and then from a deployment phase, deploy it out to uh, the respective applications or systems. We worked with a global gaming leader who had a similar problem to what I've been talking about. And the challenge that they had is that already built out and defines their DevOps process whereby apps automatically configure and build themselves. The solution that they used is they used Chef Recipes to call the Venify API to request, revoke, and replace keys and certificates all from an automated perspective. Because prior to utilizing the Venify API call, this was all very much a manual process. And as you can imagine, in an automatic build process where now everything is automated except up to the package phase where you then have to rely on manual processes to acquire and install the key and certificate, that tends to break that overall automatic uh, pro build process and slow things down significantly. The outcome was where this global gaming leader was able to rapidly tear down and replace, so on a weekly basis, rapidly tear down and replace their entire environment all automatically. So provisioning the keys and certificates into that environment, removing that barrier so that now they can, from an elastic perspective, replace out those certificates, replace out those keys, and stand up a brand new environment on a weekly basis. Second to that is they were also able to achieve IT compliance. And the IT compliance was achieved now because now they're able to apply policies to the keys and certificates that are being generated and ensure that they're able to audit the entire process through audit logging as well, all from an automated perspective using the Vetify API. 
So really what Venify helped in that global gaming-led example as, as a situation that I've gone through is we helped accelerate the deployment process by reducing the time it takes to procure and provision the certificates from days down to minutes. Now, if you think about that, think about the cost savings, think about the value that now that organization gained whereby those developers didn't need to be spending time acquiring those keys and certificates and manually deploying them. They could rather go and work on more strategic things uh, related to what related to the actual lines of business and the lines of business requirements instead of acquiring and installing those keys and certificates on a manual basis. So this is just a slide that goes through how powerful our API is from a flexibility perspective. And as you'll see here, this is a non-exhaustive list, but we have a fairly extensive uh, platform and technology partner network whereby we integrate with many of these um, technology partners to provide that I was talking about, that automation process so that you don't have to, from a manual perspective, acquire and then install the actual keys and certificates within those respective environments. We do that all for you in an automated fashion. Earlier I talked through the heterogeneous environment or the fact that most organizations today, there is no perimeter. You have to deal with enterprise mobility. You have to deal with IoT, cloud, um, containers, et cetera, and then even the traditional data center. And within that environment, there are a number of automation tools that organizations use. Venify helps centralize all of that by providing an API-driven technology and an API-driven solution whereby you can centralize that policy enforcement and you can secure the entire life cycle. So from an issuance perspective or revocation or even renewal, you can fully automate that process and do it all via API calls, which Carl's going to go through in a demonstration in a couple of minutes. Last but not least, we've got full logging so that you can ensure compliance from an audit perspective, and that you have full uh, audit logging so that you can see exactly what went on, who has access to those keys and certificates, where are they being used, et cetera. So really, Venify helps secure your business at speed. And specifically related to DevOps, if you think about it, we help organizations acquire those keys and certificates from an automated fashion. And instead of spending days to acquire and install those keys and certificates, we bring it down to minutes from an automated perspective. And then last but not least, we also help ensure IT compliance for that specific organization. So with that, what I'd like to do is I'm going to hand over to Carl, and Carl's going to run through a little bit on um, some of the API um, calls that we provide, as well as talk through a certificate utility that we have. Carl, if you wouldn't mind, over to you. Yeah, hi guys. Uh, good afternoon, um, or good morning for some of you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to sort of take off where Gavin left off and talk through sort of um, some scenarios um, that involve things like sort of continu um, continuous integration and sort of continuous delivery pipelining. Um, so as you can sort of see on screen at the moment, um, we've got um, a um, sort of typical pipeline, really. So if you look at uh, DevOps, uh, the, the, the DevOps world. A um, good example here is something like IBM Urban Code, where you can sort of sequence together uh, a whole bunch of steps that sort of manage and control your build process. So on the left-hand side, you have the configuration management and the source repository, and then we move to a sort of um, a build and test process uh, from left to right, all the way through to the deployment of the application uh, here on the far right-hand side. Um, just get my pointer um, over here on the far right hand side so you can see here um, these are could be containers these could be VMs they could be applications uh, it could be anything these types of platform handle all sorts of um, delivery sort of artifacts um, and, and, and sort of um, applications that can be pushed out so you can see what we have in a, within one stage or the particular stage here in terms of the packaging stage it's important that before we deploy these applications uh, all these containers is that we get a certificate and we include a certificate um, in the bundle and the package. 
So um, this is a good sort of example of how we can how we can push this out. Um, I'm just going to move on slightly and get my next build. So if we sort of step through this, um, we can see here um, um, this example is sort of showing a few different sort of methods and in ways we can integrate from uh, chef recipes. Um, you're going to see a chef demonstration a little bit later on. Um, Terraform, uh, Docker, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole wealth and plethora of different uh, DevOps tooling out there today. Um, we try to remain agnostic, and that's the advantage of us exposing an API. We can integrate with pretty much all of them. And then, the, as Gavin mentioned, um, we also have a tool. Um, so for customers or organizations that don't wish to get too involved in calling APIs, um, we do have a command line utility, which can be used literally from the command line. Um, and a simple one or two commands make it very, very easy to bake the Venify functionality directly into these uh, different types of platforms. The advantage here, of course, if you follow this through, um, is and any any of any of you that already know the Venify platform, we control and manage policy centrally. So really, it's a win-win situation. Security get to see and keep what they want and defy it by defining security policies, uh, but DevOps get what they need with regards to being able to go fast. So security no longer becomes a bottleneck. They can move these pipelines and run these things uh, as fast or as slow as they would like to. Um, so I'm going to talk through, and this, there's some more information on this in a, in a, in a moment um, when I sort of move on to the demo. Um, so this is a sort of a, um, an overview of how we would integrate um, the Chef framework into uh, Vanify Trust Protection Platform. So you can see um, this is typical on the right-hand side here. Um, so let's move this um, little point around again, sorry. Um, on the um, right-hand side here, uh, so the left-hand side of this diagram, we have the Chef server. And then in the sort of chef world, we've got a bunch of nodes, which are typically the endpoints, and they have, have the chef uh, client installed on them. And all of them connect back and talk to the chef server. So the advantage here is that if we can get the Venify cookbook deployed onto the chef server, the cookbook automatically becomes available uh, to all of the chef nodes, all of the, all the chef clients out here. So the sort of workflow here is that the developer would normally build the Chef cookbook in his own environment here on the Chef development workstation. Uh, that would be pushed down into the sort of centralized cookbook repository on the Chef server, and then it can be consumed by any of the nodes uh, within, the, within the infrastructure that are running the Chef client. And you can see here the Chef cookbook has been configured to call the Venify TPP API here. And then once it's done that, you get all the benefits that you are used to today within, within the world of Venify, the ability to talk to in as many internal CAs as you like and as many external CAs as you would like. So that's the sort of typical um, workflow. You can see what we have within this cookbook. And this is a sample cookbook, uh, which can be made available on request. So the uh, options within this cookbook are fairly straightforward, very, fairly simple. We have the ability to request a new certificate check on a certificate status, uh, retrieve a certificate, or revoke a certificate. So those are the sort of main four steps uh, at a high level uh, that would be required to manage and, and, and control key certificate lifecycle within your, within your environment. So moving on to the next use case. Um, oh, the diagram has gone a little bit uh, um, fragmented. Um, I have a clearer diagram in a moment, so um, I will be able to explain in more detail how that looks. Um, so this is integrating with, with Docker. And um, for those of you know that uh, know anything about Docker, Docker is sort of really the new kid on the block. And um, it's gaining a lot of traction within large organizations because it significantly reduces the time from development to deployment. So it's now possible to bundle up an entire application and package up an entire application with all of the dependencies it needs to put it from test all the way through to production. The bottleneck, however, in most of the time, um, in terms of getting these um, containers, as they're called, these Docker containers, these things down here, pushed out into a production environment, um, is the ability to get keys and certificates quickly. So in the world of containers, containers can start and stop pretty much on demand. And they can have a lifetime of anything from typically days, months, years. 
Uh, sometimes, however, they can be set to just run for milliseconds. So they'll run, they'll run one specific task and then they will exit. However, depending on the task required, um, most of the time they are likely to need a certificate. One, if they're running a service, they need a TLS SSL certificate uh, to expose and run a service, a secure web service. But secondly, quite often they would need a key and certificate to communicate securely to other containers or other services within the infrastructure. So the use case here um, is, and I'm, in fact, what I will do is I'll jump to my other um, diagram now because the diagram is much clearer. I'm just going to very quickly switch screens for you. And let's go to the um, other diagram in here. I'm just going to jump to that, and I'll come back to that. So this is the diagram that was on screen a moment ago. Um, what we're doing here is we're binding uh, into the Docker event system. So Docker has a uh, powerful event uh, monitoring mechanism. On this diagram here, you can see we've got two Docker host machines. Uh, running what we call the Docker daemon. Okay, so the Docker daemon is the sort of global Docker service that runs on the Docker host. And then what we're doing here is we're actually hooking into the, uh, the Docker event API. Everything that happens on the Docker machine uh, has its own event mechanism. So we can tap into that very easily. And by tapping into that, we can bind the um, container uh, in this instance, the start and stop, the start and die um, um, uh, uh, events directly into our API. So what we end up here is, is when a container starts, it will automatically make a request to Venify TPP to request a certificate. And when the container stops or dies, it will automatically revoke the certificate within Venify Trust Protection Platform. So what we're able to do there is, is pretty much automate and, and, and uh, bind the container life cycle uh, to the key and certificate life cycle within Venify Trust Protection Platform. You will see a demo of this um, earlier. And then finally, when it dies, um, as you can see on the diagram here, the revocation request gets passed all the way through to the certificate authority. So we have the ability to automatically revoke the certificate rather than you manually having to go through and then manually revoke certificates when Docker containers have finished or exited or been killed off. So I'm going to move on to um, a demo now. I'm going to go back to our chef use case. And I'm just going to jump back to that. So here's the diagram we were referencing in the previous slide. We have integration with uh, integrating TPP with chef. Um, this environment, I've sort of pretty much got set up in a, in a lab, uh, lab demo environment here with the exception of the chef server. I'm not running the chef server for simplicity. I'm just running uh, a chef node. And then I have a, a Venify trust protection platform cookbook installed with the relevant connectivity through to a live TPP server instance. And as I mentioned earlier, these are the, these are the requests that are currently set up. We can request new certificates from within the cookbook, check certificate status, retrieve certificate, revoke certificate. So that makes it really easy for developers now or DevOps teams to literally bind into the other cookbooks that they have. And the advantage of chef cookbooks is you can chain these requests together and you can chain cookbooks together. And in fact, the demo I'm going to show you will show you um, chaining a couple of these requests together. So we'll, we'll chain them all together so we get an end-to-end -end process. And to configure the cookbook, we have this thing called a configuration uh, attributes file. Any of you that are familiar with Chef will know that we've got various attributes that you can set from within a standard config file. So these can be stored in a, in a local config file, but um, a more secure way to store them, especially that we've got things like passphrases or passwords stored in here, would not be able, not to use the local config file, but to use uh, the Chef vaulting service or another vault type service that would run within this DevOps environment. A couple of things here. This is the, uh, the trust protection policy that we're going to reference, and you'll see this in action in a minute. This is the certificate authority, the CA that we want to reference. Um, and then here, this is the actual directory um, where we're going to deploy or provision the keys and certificates once the request has been fulfilled by TPP. 
So, moving on to a, a, a demo. So let's sort of take you through this. Um, what you can see on screen at the top here um, is the chef command that I'm going to be running. Chef is a little bit verbose, but normally this stuff gets sort of wrapped up so you don't have to sort of type all of these things. And you can see here, um, I've got three of the requests that we mentioned earlier. The One of them actually, which wasn't on the slide, is the authenticate request. So that's what's needed to actually re or initially authenticate the Venify Trust Protection Platform. And then we're going to request the certificate, and then we're going to retrieve the certificate. And to show, show you that this is a live demo, um, I have um, an instance of Trust Protection Platform running here. And I will show you that here. And for the chef demo, we're going to reference this container, this policy container here called Chef Automation. Notice there's nothing within that container at the moment. It's an empty container. OK. And we'll come back and we'll look at the Docker containers in a moment. So without further ado, um, what I'm going to do is just show you the contents of the directory that we're going to write the, uh, in this case, we're going to request a P12. And we're going to write this bundle here. Um, you can see this directory is currently empty. There's no, there's no keys or certificates within that directory. So let's go ahead and, uh, and make a request here uh, and see if we can get a, a certificate, uh, a key and certificate down. So the first thing we're going to do is request. You can see the last command on this chain here. I'm going to just request. At this point, I'm not going to retrieve the certificate. I'm just going to run the first two. So we're just going to authenticate to the trust protection platform and request a new certificate based on these parameters. And you can see from this command, I'm actually overriding some of the commands that are uh, from within this file here. So this sort of attributes file is where you can set defaults and things, so you don't have to uh, remember them or run them as part of the command. But in this instance, uh, I'm actually going to override them just by specifying them within here. So let's run this request. Um, Chef is um, a, little, um, a little verbose. Um, you'll get a whole bunch of stuff that gets sort of spat out on the command line. Um, but I'll sort of scroll to some of the parts that are of interest. So we'll ignore this stuff at the bottom. Um, but you can see here, um, these are some messages we've got back from our trust protection platform. And this is the interesting uh, response here. We have a response that says we have a new certificate now that's been, recre uh, that's been created on Venify TPP. If we scroll up a little bit, um, you can see uh, I'm logging everything. Um, ordinarily, you wouldn't log everything, especially this. Because you can see here, this is the point where we requested our API key from Trust Protection Platform. That would be something in the real world in a production environment that you wouldn't normally uh, push out to a log file. So let's just go back up here now. And we're going to go back to our Trust Protection Platform and refresh the screen. And you can see here now we have a certificate that's been requested. It's already been uh, enrolled to the certificate authority. In this case, it's a Microsoft Windows CA. OK, it's called Nginx. And we have a serial number. And this is the um, obviously this, the, the, the standard X509 certificate metadata that you can see here. Um, let's go back and see if we can take a look at that certificate. Um, well, actually, we can't take a look at it because we haven't yet actually requested it and provisioned it because I didn't run the final retrieve certificate command. So let's go get that certificate now. And I'm just going to change this to a retrieve and then hit return on that. And again, it goes off and runs a bunch of chef commands here. And you can see here, um, we've now got a suggested file name. So this is Trust Protection Platform suggesting the relevant file name. Um, and this is the file format for PKCS12. And if we go back up here now and we take a look, you can see now we have a P12 file in this directory. Um, now, I should have a command here, pre-populated. Um, that allows us to take a look at the subject. Here we go. So this is just standard OpenSSL now. So I'm just going to take a look at that. There we go. You can see there, this is real. This is a real certificate. So that's the subject. And if we run that command one more time, and we type in serial, we can get the serial number of the certificate. To take a note, that ends in a 05C. If we go back to Trust Protection Platform, you can see it matches the serial number here. 
So it's the exact same certificate that we requested and was issued through the Venify Trust Protection Platform. So, very easy, just to summarize what I've just shown, taking you through, um, just going to jump back up to here. Um, we have the ability now to hook into the Venify Trust Protection Platforms API. We can create our own cookbooks, and those cookbooks can be as complex or as simplistic as you, as you need. Um, and the, as I said earlier, you can very easily bind and chain those cookbooks together with your existing cookbooks. So if you've already built a process, um, that does things with keys and certificates for some of your applications, you could very easily swap out that cookbook and replace it with the Venify Trust Protection Platform cookbook so that all of the keys and key and certificate requests are automated back through the Venify TPP API. So end-to-end, -end, very, very easy, and your chef puppet environments um, are no longer constrained by the time it takes to get keys and certificates into the environment. So the next demonstration I have is a Docker uh, demonstration. And we've already sort of um, taken a look at this schematic diagram here. Um, what we're going to do here is um, we're going to run up a, a, a process that monitors the Docker event queue here. And we're going to create a container. And we're going to make that request to Venify Trust Protection Platform. And we're going to start the container, uh, which actually is running within the container, um, the Nginx application web server. So um, if I just refresh this now, this should fail because my container is no longer running. Um, yeah, it's been a timeout on me because there is no container running. This is one I was using earlier for testing. So this is the standard Nginx homepage. This is just the standard default implementation of Nginx that's been packaged up as a Docker container. There we go. We've got nothing. And again, in Trust Protection Platform, if we look at the Docker containers uh, directory, uh, or policy container, rather, it's completely empty. So we're going to go back now, and let's fix that. And let's get us an Nginx container running, complete with a valid key and certificate. So. Um, I've split the screen into two, into two sections here. Um, this is our service that's running. Um, just prove it is a service that's running. Um, so this is a service that's just literally running a very, very simple Python script that's just monitoring the Docker event. Um, and we can start that up again. Let's put the password in. So you can see here it's saying it's using TPP instance and then the IP address of the TPP server that it's actually using uh, to, to fulfill these requests. And then um, what you can see in the middle of the screen here is a command. So this is a Docker command um, that, that's used to create a brand new Docker container, a brand new Nginx Docker container. Um, give it an IP address. Um, but um, what you will see here is that I've actually, there is nothing specific here that references the fact that this needs a certificate, because that has been defined at the Docker event level. So this is what we now have is the ability, without doing anything uh, specific to a Docker container, we can pass a key certificate into it simply by using and monitoring the Docker events mechanism. So I'm going to run this command so we can see this working. Um, I have one here that's pre-populated. So I'm actually running two commands. I'm literally running a new Docker container based on an existing Docker image from the Docker repos. I'm giving it an IP address. You can see there of 203. 0113.42, and I'm binding it to a Docker network, and I'm also giving it a host name of nginx.contosa.com. And then the final command after these ampersand signs that you can see there, um, we're, just telling, we're just telling the command to actually just look at the, the log file so we can see something happening. So let's start that up. Need a sudo command. Okay, so you can see um, it's already started, and you can see here at the event screen at the top, it's already made a request to our TPP server. And it says here it's waiting for the certificate to be issued. And you can see if you look at the Nginx container, it's just going to wait for a few seconds for that certificate. And you can see if you watch it, it's updating. It's now got the certificate. In fact, this happened fairly quickly. So you can see now 
We got a certificate from TPT because TPT issued the certificate, X509 certificate, and we injected that certificate and the key into the Docker container. So bear in mind, none of this was written to a file system. This was all done within the APIs and all done within memory. We're not storing anything in, in files or anything like that. We're just making a request to the API. We're telling TPP to request a new certificate, and then we're retrieving that certificate once it's been issued and pushing it straight into the container. Then we're writing it into the container's file system here. So you can see here at the bottom, this is where we've written it into the container's file system. And then once that key and certificate that is there, we start Nginx. So the service is now started and running. And if we go back to our container here, and we refresh this or reload this page, OK, there we go. We've now got a connection. It's a valid, secure SSL connection. We'll take a look at the certificate. Um, more information, view certificate. There is our certificate. It's been issued by this certificate authority. And you can see here, this is the serial number, 0058. And if you remember that, we will jump back and take a look at it in our Venify Trust Protection Platform. And we now have a certificate object within this container. And if we look at the settings for that, so we just scroll down here. Um, you can see this is our certificate. Oh, uh, that's interesting. Uh, ah, so any of you uh, may have spotted there was a, probably a refresh issue there. That's not the right certificate. It's 5D. So I probably need to refresh this page a couple of times. I think the browser is probably doing some caching here. So this container is brand new. Let's take another look at that now. Proving you that this is a real demo. There we go. It's updated it. So there's the, there's the certificate, the serial number for the certificate, which ends in a 005D. Okay, and you can see that's pretty transparent. Um, and you can see down here, here's our here's our certificate serial number. So again, end to end, um, we're now we're now able to inject the keys and certificates directly into the Docker container. And if we now just um, kill this process here, I'm now going to kill the Docker container um, because um, what that's going to do now is that will trigger the revocation process. So those of you that know Docker, we just type in sudo docker. Um, if we type in docker ps, yeah, you can see there's our container. It's running. It was started three minutes ago. But we're just going to run um, a couple of other commands now. We're just going to kill it by typing kill. And then we just provide the name. .com. OK. And if you watch carefully at the top, you can see here we've now issued a revocation request to Venify TPP using the API by hooking in, as I said earlier, to the uh, Docker event system. The success was true, so it now successfully revoked that certificate. And if we go back to here and we refresh this and we pick our Docker certificate, you can see that has already been revoked. So the revocation has now been completed. So it's been revoked within TPP. You can see it's revoked. And if you were to check the certificate on the certificate authority, you would see that that certificate has also been um, has also been revoked at the certificate authority level two. Let's just summarize uh, again what we've done here. Uh, we'll go back up to our diagram here. So we've hooked into the Docker event subsystem. We created a new container. And part of that container, part of that startup process, made a request all the way through to Trust Protection Platform, which requested a brand new certificate. And then the Docker event monitor system um, the trigger that was generated by that was used to inject the keys and certificates directly into the container that we started. And then when we stopped or we killed the container, we, look, we listened for the container die event. We passed that back to a revocation request within TPP and dynamically revoked the certificate at the certificate authority level. And I'm going to hand back to Gavin now, because that concludes my demonstration.
Thanks, Carl. Really powerful demonstrations, I think, with some quite common um, issues that many organizations face today, specifically related to DevOps use cases. Good stuff. I'm just going to bring up the slide deck quickly then, again, and um, as a quick recap and final steps, some things to consider. Um, as you've seen, we've talked a little bit about pain points uh, related to uh, the vulnerabilities or risks introduced by DevOps teams and some of those pain points as well that DevOps teams have that Carl actually demonstrated uh, in, the, in his examples there on how DevOps teams can fully automate that process. So as far as next steps are concerned, it's quite critical, you know, identify which respective pain points you want to first resolve. So is it within, as, and as you see in the, some of the examples that Carl went through, um, he showed you Chef as well as Docker, but there's definitely uh, other continuous delivery platforms or solutions that we do support via our API. Um, also, Carl mentioned and Carl went through some examples of those different integration options. So as he touched on, you can do direct API calls, or you can, and this goes back to what integration opportunities should you evaluate. So is it a direct API call into the Venify platform? Is it specific uh, Chef or um, Terraform or other types of recipes which we can provide um, to you based on request? Or is it the use of the certificate utility that Paul also went through whereby um, the private key, for example, is not generated within the trust protection platform, but it's generated within your DevOps environment. So we never see the private key at, at all, yet we're still enforcing policy for you within those specific environments. And then finally, once you've evaluated which options you want to go with, and by all means you could go with all three, um, develop an action plan as to how you want to go about implementing that then. So with that, uh, I'd like to open it up for questions, please, Julie. And um, as far as a call to action here, we do have a white paper as well as a solutions brief, which goes through many of the details that Carl went through today on some of those integration options and how you can address some of the pain points that you're dealing with from a DevOps perspective within your organization. If you go to our website, forward slash DevOps, you can gain access to those specific uh, pieces of material that are ready for you. With that, I'd like to open it up to any questions. If you would like, you can also post your questions into the um, Q&A or chat window, and both Carl and myself will address those. Carl, I see there's one question here, and maybe you can address it. But as far as recipes are concerned, um, generally uh, you showed a couple of examples for the recipes uh, that you've worked on for Chef. Uh, which other recipes sure. are in the pipeline that you're currently working on? So, yes, yeah, good question. So um, the it's important to point out, really, that the, 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 the recipes are really just um, – ways of demonstrating and showing developers how they can integrate and interact with their API. So they're going to be more familiar with these sort of chef cookbooks and, and, and playbooks or whatever you want to call them than, 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 than we are or uh, a particular vendor would be because generally they, they create, customize, and tune these cookbooks to suit their own specific requirements. So what we've done here is we've, we've produced sample, what I call sample cookbooks, which are just really sort of Kickstarter cookbooks or playbooks that really show a developer what they need to do to get started with getting into the Venify TPP API. And, and we've got a number of customers now that have pretty much used those as a blueprint just to get things started, uh, and they've sort of moved off and then highly modified uh, what we've already given them as part of their own sort of overall solution. So we can make those available. Um, the plan, um, as Gavin said, is to get as many samples pulled together as we possibly can, as quickly as we can. So right now I've got samples for 
uh, as you saw, Chef. I've got an example for uh, how we can do stuff with Docker. Um, the next one on, on the list is IBM Urban Code. Um, we're getting a lot of customers now that are uh, automating their, um, particularly their IBM, MQ, and WebSphere builds and deployment processes, and key certificates are becoming hard and becoming a bottleneck for them there too. So um, the next step, as I said, is to provide this urban code example, which just really shows them how they can splice calls to our API directly into their urban code uh, workflows. Um, the, other thing, the other one we have um, is HashiCore's Terraform. Um, so that is um, one that we already have, and that, that can actually be made available. Um, and then finally, we're looking at things like SaltStack, uh, Ansible, um, Puppet, um, and um, sort of that, that really sort of probably ticks off the majority of them. I mean, and, and potentially some of the open source continuous integration, continuous delivery uh, frameworks such as uh, Jenkins, maybe Spinnaker from Netflix, uh, and some of those. So we sort of, we'll, we'll sort of pick them off in sort of order of priority, in order of popularity. Great, thanks, Carl. I see there's another question, and I'll, I'll probably just take it here. Um, the question is, where could we get the uh, certificate of utility? Um, so to answer that, we'll be posting the certificate of utility onto GitHub in the next couple of days. And if you go back to our website, forward slash DevOps, uh, there will be a reference there where to find the specific utility. Or uh, you can, of course, just search for the specific utility as well on GitHub. It will be made available there in the next few days. I don't see any other questions uh, in the panel. Julie, do you see any questions? Any more questions? Okay. With that, as Julie mentioned, this webinar will be made available for on-demand viewing. So please feel free to visit venify.com and uh, review this webinar for future reference. And uh, we'll be get, getting that uh, certificate utility as well posted to GitHub within the next few days. So you can download that directly from GitHub or request the specific recipes directly from Venify. And you can do that through a contact me on our website, uh, which you can find um, also via the forward slash DevOps uh, link on our website. Thank you, everybody, and have a good day.